This episode is HACCP 101, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. Enjoy. Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. In his way, the meat cutter is an artist. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. Mr. President, my understanding is that while you en route to tonight's program, uh, while aboard Air Force One, you called an area hospital because you were concerned and, and wanted to speak to some parents and some children who've been affected by the E. coli bacteria contamination in this area. I'd like to introduce Vicki and Darren Duttweiler, whose 16-month-old son remains in critical condition at Tacoma's Mary Bridge Hospital, and they have a question uh, concerning health care. Mr. President, actually our child is at Children's Hospital in Seattle, but he is in intensive care in critical condition. And only two days prior to him um, going in there with E. coli poisoning from tainted meat, my husband lost his job and we were left without medical coverage. I'm Canadian originally and always took comfort in the medical system there and in knowing that my children would be taken care of. My question to you now is, what are you prepared to do in regards to the tainted meat problem? And is there any hope in the near future of seeing universal health care so that no one else has to go through what we've gone through? Let me first of all say uh, I thank you for being on the program and I hope your child will be well. I did call two other sets of parents who were in the hospital with their children on the way out here just to inquire about that and to get their ideas about what we should do. Let me answer your second question first. Uh, as I'm sure you know, I've asked my wife to head a task force to come up with a bill within 100 days which will bring a new system of health care to America, which offers us the, the chance to provide basic health coverage to everybody, to stop people from losing their health coverage when they lose a job, to stop people from their inability to change jobs because they've had someone in their family sick, and to bring the cost of health care in line with inflation. I think we can do that, and if we don't do it, we'll never balance the budget, and we'll never restore health to this economy. Fifty percent of the projected deficit growth between now and the year 2000 is all in health care costs. So it is a hor it's a terrific human issue, but it's a big economic issue for America. And the answer to your question is, within 100 days of my becoming president, we're going to have a bill to the Congress to do just what you said. Now, the second thing, this E. coli thing, have you all been following it up in Washington? It's, it's a... I asked Secretary of Agriculture, Mike Espy, uh, who is responsible for the regulation of the the slaughterhouses and the, and, and the meat before it comes to a restaurant to go up there and look into the situation. Uh, and we think there are two things that have to be done. First of all, we've got to make it clear to people who are providing fast food that they've got to do everything they can to comply with our cooking regulations. Some of those viruses would have clearly died had the heat been observed. On the other hand, we've got to find ways to do more inspections and to try to do them in a more effective way. And so we are reviewing now the possibility of not only hiring more inspectors, which I've already agreed to do, but secondly, seeing if there is some way we can do a better job of actually inspecting the meat, empowering the inspectors to do some more things. We have got to do that. And I can tell you, if you have any other ideas, I'd like to have them. We have the parents, it struck me that I talked to you today, had some actually some quite good ideas that we're going to pursue. And I want to invite you and any others who are listening who have other ideas to let me know. But you can look forward to more inspectors, and we're looking for ways to inspect better as well. So in that case, you're, uh, you're increasing government. We are there. Yes, but that's a direct service to people. That's not the, a waste of bureaucracy. I mean, I think the American people want us to make sure they're safe. The 1993 Washington Department of Health E. coli outbreak investigation led to the discovery that regular-sized hamburger patties and jumbo hamburger patties produced by Vaughn Companies of California and sold by Jack in the Box were the source of a massive E. coli outbreak. The, outbra the outbreak strain of E. coli 0157-H7 was isolated from 11 lots of hamburger patties produced on November 29th and November 30th, 1992, and Jack in the Box issued a recall of all the ground beef produced on that day that was still in the restaurants. Since the ground beef identified as the source 
of the outbreak had been distributed to Jack in the Box restaurants in Washington, Idaho, California, and Nevada. All states investigated the cases of bloody diarrhea that had been reported since November 15, 1992, to determine whether patients had eaten hamburgers from Jack in the Box in the days before coming, becoming ill. By the end of February 1993, the states had reported the following. Washington reported that 602 patients with bloody diarrhea, or HUS, 477 Washingtonians were cultured, confirmed with E. coli infections, took samples, put it in a culture, and that's how they did determined it. With illnesses uh, peaking between January 17th and January 20th of uh, 1993, 114 people were hospitalized, uh, seven developed HUS, and three died. And that's in the state of Washington alone. Really? What? Wow. And the numbers go on. Idaho confirmed uh, 14 uh, with one developing HUS. And then uh, California, six cultures confirmed with one death of a child. And then Nevada, nine people were hospitalized, three developing HUS. Jesus. As a result, 73 jack-in-the-box restaurants were ultimately identified as part of the E. coli outbreak and recall. 73 restaurants. Over the course of the outbreak investigation and the litigation that followed, documents from Foodmaker, the San Diego-based parent company of jack-in-the-box, reveal that the company had been warned by local health departments and by their own employees that they were undercooking their hamburgers prior to the outbreak. But the company decided that cooking beef to 155 degrees, the standard set by the Washington Department of Health, made the meat too tough. Oof. Oof. That's, <laughs> that's negligence. Yeah, it sounds like there's an awful lot of collagen in those burgers. Yeah. Signs and symptoms of E. coli infection of E. coli O. 157H7, acute hemorrhagic diarrhea, which means there's mm. blood in your diarrhea, um, severe cramping. And when I got Campylobacter, um, I experienced Oof. cramping for the first time. And it feels, it's not like, oh, I got, I got diarrhea. It's like someone stabbing you from the inside. It is like stabbing. I, I've never had that terrible disease that you had. I Knock on wood. Um, but I have had food poisoning, which I am sure is just a fraction of the pain of Campylobacter. The only way I would find comfort was pretty much in the fetal position while I shit my pants. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, usually little or no uh, fever is pre presence, and illness resolves itself in about five or ten days. So if you're healthy you're, and you got a good immune system, you're just going to you're just going to have bad diarrhea um, with, with bad cramping. And, you know, I'm sure there's more undocumented cases of uh, E. coli because people just get through it. But it's kind of a normal Saturday. Yeah. But about two to seven percent of infections can lead to kidney complications. And this is usually in children and the elderly, children under five. And if you've ever seen images of mass E. coli infection of children, uh, their whole body swells up, they're leaking out of every orifice, and their kidneys shut down, and they eventually die. Because of this, uh, this is why the United States has implemented HACCP, which is uh, Hazard Analysis Contritical Control Points. It's a system to prevent uh, foodborne uh, Ill illnesses, bacteria, chemical, uh, physical hazards. And what it is essentially is in the food process there are key points where something can go wrong that are easily monitored uh, that if you just take the second to double check your equipment's working, that something's boiling or something's cooling rapidly or check to see if something's clean and you document that to prove that you did it, then it could help prevent these illnesses. In the early 1960s, a collaborated effort between the Pillsbury Company, NASA, and the U.S. Army Laboratories began with the objective to provide safe food for space expeditions. In order to ensure that the food would be sent, um, that would be sent to space was safe, they imposed strict microbial requirements, including pathogen limits, uh, including E. coli, salmonella, and Clostridium botulinum, or botulism as we know it. 
Using the traditional end product testing method, it was soon realized that almost all of the food manufactured was being used for testing and very little was left for actual use. Therefore, a new approach was needed. NASA's own requirements for critical control points, which we'll learn about momentarily, and engineering management would be used as a guide for food safety. I just imagine the Pillsbury Doughboy in outer space. <laughs> <laughs> I, I imagine the astronauts eating the Pillsbury Doughboy yeah. in outer space and wanting to make sure that he's safe. And if you want to know why this was developed, because just simply, if you're an astronaut and you have a foodborne illness, your nearest hospital is on another planet <laughs> is not where you are and can you imagine uh hemorrhagic diarrhea with zero gravity i know yes i can Ooh. i imagine it all the time <laughs> are you drinking a bottle of wine <laughs> yeah it was, it's just the tail end of it okay it is nine right. in the morning not, no, where not you here are. okay no 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 <laughs> no, I, I always have a glass of wine uh, around lunchtime, but today I didn't have time to grab a glass. So it's very European of you. Yeah. In 1994, HACCP was put into effect in every USDA plant in America as a result of the Jack in the Box outbreak. I just really want to say that I am in no way against Jack in the Box. I love um, crappy food at three in the morning when I have a nice, good uh, buzz going. Although it is something I haven't eaten in probably six years, just because of my lifestyle and being married and uh, things like that, I'm not saying it is bad or anything of that nature. The 60s original HACCP plan was a three principle. The later adopted for the United States was a seven principle. And the principles are this. What started off as three principles is now seven. The first is conduct a hazard analysis. The second, identify critical control points. Now, this is where you look at a situation and wonder, can this potentially be dangerous? Cooking, cooling, uh, trimming, uh, something like that. Uh, establish a critical limit for each of these critical control points. Establish a critical control monitoring requirements. Establish a corrective action. Establish procedures for encouraging the HACCP system is working as intended. And seven, establish record keeping. So the seven HACCP principles, which we're going to talk about shortly, are included in the international standard ISO 22000 FSMS 2011. This standard is basically a complete food safety and quality management system incorporating the elements of prerequisite programs. And um, HACCP and the quality management system together form an organization's total quality management system. Training for developing and implementing HACCP food safety management are offered by a, uh, a lot of places you can go through the college. I was trained just by one. He, he was um, an ex vet for the USDA and then a current. Um, a current plant manager, you know, quality control specialist at, at a plant. Uh, Travis, who, who trained you? University of New Hampshire and a bunch of vets and nerds. Yeah, nerds. Yeah. Has some nerds. But, but just, <laughs> I, uh, you and I, can, in theory, could teach a HACCP class through the International HACCP Alliance, but people have doctorates in this. No kidding. Yeah. Why not? Sure. I said it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I like it. I think, I think doc, uh, doc may as well have one. Yeah. A, a doctorate in how to establish, you know, uh, exploit loopholes in the HACCP system. What I liked about him is that he <laughs> hated the government. I know <laughs> that was the best part, which, you know, is why he's so great with the loopholes. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. He was the best. Yeah, it, it, that's just like, why would you write that in there? Why would you want to make yeah. it work for yourself? Yeah, We're, we'll have to bleep out his name probably. <laughs> so let's let's talk about the um, let's talk about the seven principles. Using let's let's use an example slaughter. That's a great idea. What people don't realize is that animals, besides having uh, 
potential for their gut being pierced or whatever to expose their stomach content often aren't in, entirely clean. No, not at all. I mean, they're covered in feces. Yeah, they, they even animals kept in dry pens in the best work conditions, you know, and shit in the corners are still going to have poop all over them. It, it is what it is. Yeah. And I mean, Listeria lives in soil and dust, you know, I mean. Let's use red meat slaughter, beef. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's going to be two uh, critical control points established. And so basically, if I understand, you know, what that means is the government requires you to have two points in the process where you are identifying a potential hazard um, and, you know, eliminating it or at least figuring it out. Right. Yeah. Well, the government doesn't require the plants requiring it and the, or the plant genuinely is going to come up with it. And if you could, okay. if you could prove that there is no potential then you know you could do whatever you want like oh so yeah i i did not know that i i that's but I you just learned something right there but you can't prove it i think the best <laughs> yeah right <laughs> the best thing i heard is from this guy in southern california if, if i had documentation saying i could whip out my dick and slap the meat then the government would have to do it or let me do it yeah that's true I think the uh, University of Wisconsin has some supporting documentation about that. Yeah. So, uh, principle one, conduct a hazard analysis. There's poop on animals. Animals have ingesta in their stomach. So, that's we're looking at that. Uh, identify a critical control point. That is going to be your final rail uh, that before it enters the cooler. That's going to be your... That's why you have uh, trimmers. A lot of time they're low level positions, but they're also one of the most important jobs on the plant. Yeah. I mean, hypoth okay, so like I'm on the truck by myself, I'm siding the animal, I stick my knife through the hide, bring it back up for, you know, another swipe, and I wipe some poop on on the flank, right? Mm -hmm. And when I'm gutting it, I'm coming down the gut i have to take my hand out to adjust something i put my my hand back in with the knife and i pinch the pinch the, the first stomach up against the the skin and pierce it and there's ingest all over myself and the front hocks and the brisket right yeah um so those are two two times that a hazard could come into play and now say that's happened how are we going to fix that with our hassa plan First, you're going to wash and uh, sanitize yourself and spray down your apron and wash your hands and clean your knife. And then you're going to go over the carcass and you're going to say you got a pierced gut and you got shit running down the side. You're going to trim that area uh, with a knife and your knife can't cross the contamination. Your knife has to go from clean surface area to clean surface area with the contamination staying on the piece of meat not touching the knife because if you touch the knife then your knife is going to be contaminated and then each time you cut i would recommend even though it's not written that you sanitize your knife and uh you're going to be looking for ingesta this is called the final inspection and you're going to be looking for ingesta hair uh, fecal and other hazards that may occur like rail dust um, and you're going to find that on the hawks and then you're going to when you think you're done you're going to document it and depending on how your plans are written the USDA may want to inspect it after you I've worked at places where the USDA will look at 100% of the carcasses mm -hmm. I've worked at places where they will look at about 10% of the carcasses for physical. Um, and then if they find something uh, in, it, it's one of those things that it, it is much as it pains to, to say it, in a small environment, uh, you look at, at something over and over again, you will find something. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 
you're going to find like Absolutely. a little tiny hair. You're going to find some speck of something. But if they find something egregious, they could they could write you up, which is the NR. Because mm-hmm. at this point, you have signed off on your documentation that it is cleaned in that that that's a whole other thing is responding to an NR. Yeah, I don't think we've actually talked about NRs here. Um, if you want to, you know, we could talk about what those are. I don't know what it actually stands for, what it, what that's uh, an acronym for, but I, I know it's like a non-compliance, a, a singular non-compliance, right? Not non-compliance report. Oh, okay. I got you. Um, they're fun. <laughs> yeah, they're great. <laughs> they make my day. Um, well, it's nice. It's nice when you get to feed it to them, though, because everything's going so well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like, look over here. Just give me this one. <laughs> uh, when David meant uh, feeding them one, that means that the USDA pretty much they have a supervisor that needs to know that they're doing their job at your plant. So if you go a few weeks or a month or two months without getting an NR, their supervisor is going to want to know. Uh, make sure they're doing their job. So you more or less present a NR that's not that bad. It's to justify their job and their position. Because a plant with no NRs usually has the supervisor come on down and be like, and then when he shows up, he's going to end up finding about five or six. Trust me. I've seen it happen multiple locations from inspectors not doing their job in the first place. Essentially, they have to justify their position. So after you're done trimming and it passes, um, then you're going to do a second CCP because they know that you're not going to see everything on the antimicrobial level as far as things that leaked out of the animal or contaminations. So you're going to use a antimicrobial intervention such as acetic acid, citrus acid, or lactic acid. You're looking for a plate log reduction of seven. And the way you're going to find that is if you first open up, you're going to do a, uh, to prove you get a seven log reduction, you're going to do a verification study where you send stuff out to be tested to a lab. You're going to send out samples for about a month to build data to support what you're doing is working. Build a report uh, in-house supporting this um also all that available all that information is online and all the usda knows this already but you still have to do it at your plant but the cool thing about these reports is that you only have to do it once per ccp i think that's reasonable that every plant has to do it even though the information is very findable very quickly oh i I guess i guess i want to know that somebody's going to take the time to understand it themselves and then let's say, so yeah, let's say you get an NR. Um, mm-hmm. you, what you need to do with the NR is you need to address what happened, what you did, and what you're going to prevent it. Uh, what happened? There's poop on that carcass. What did you do? You removed the poop. How are you going to prevent it? Retraining. Your answer should always be retraining. <laughs> always retrain. <laughs> because it's so vague. Um. They're going to sign it off, and then they're going to sign it off. And then also, if you get an NR, you could dispute any of it. I, I will tell you that my new inspector uh, definitely looks at me sideways when I use retrain every time. <laughs> yeah. Because he's been around for a long time. <laughs> he knows He knows what I, I've got nothing new for him. Yeah. You know. Um, okay, so let's see. We're on, uh, we're on number four. Um, or number three, actually. Establish critical limits for each critical control point. So the critical control point was um, we recognize that there's a hazard because of pooper ingesta. It's the final rail. We're inspecting the carcass. There is pooper or ingesta. How much is too much? So that's going to, on those two items, is a zero tolerance. Um, Any amount is too much. Uh, So your trimmer should really have uh you know good sets of eyes i've sent people to get eye exams after getting nrs to see if that was the problem (laughs) oh that's pretty good that was my root cause analysis like what's causing this maybe this guy can't see yeah i like that 
Yeah. Well, you know, for example, though, let's say we decided that our hazard was um, bacterial outgrowth due to temperature mm-hmm. or thermal abuse, and we're in, we're you know, say we're cutting in an unrefrigerated cut room, and we're away from slaughter at this point. So we're we're in a cut room. We're cutting carcasses that have already been down to temp from the slaughtering process. Mm-hmm. And okay, so continue. I, I'm just trying to paint the scene for our listeners. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I skipped that part. And so we're we've identified a hazard as meat that's too warm mm-hmm. because our room is is not refrigerated. So a critical limit for the critical control point would be. How warm is too warm? It varies. Um, a lot of places I have worked use the Tompkins study, where you take temperatures at the point of packaging, uh, and a the critical limit. I've worked at a place where they had growth modules that showed that a critical limit couldn't be above uh, forty degrees for product. I've also worked at places that had uh, growth modules that allowed it to get up to uh, 54 degrees at packaging, um, w- which is great. Now, I've only ever worked in refrigerated cut rooms, uh, w- which I, which is a plus. I would say that if anybody has not read the Tompkins report, they should because it is juicy. Yeah. And full of inter- uh, interesting facts that you could probably whip out at a dinner party or, or a picnic or something and really blow some people's minds about how warm meat takes quite a while. It makes m- me grocery shopping a whole new level. Like, that's nah, fine. <laughs> it's, in the, it's in the car for eight hours. I don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, once we get up to 72 hours, we'll, re- we'll re- you know, think twice. Yeah. Um, and then there's another uh, CCP where I've worked where people would, have room temperature be a factor where if you couldn't start cutting until the room was below 50 degrees, which is hard to maintain uh, sometimes. Now, let's say you're in an unrefrigerated cutting room and you're doing this all good. Those growth modules are going to show that you're going to have to do a midday cleanup and sanitation because of surface bacteria from the meat now being exposed in this warm environment Mm -hmm. Let's say you have a window of two to four hours of product being out, depending on what supporting documentation you use in the temperature, ambient temperature of the room, you're going to have to stop a, usually around lunch and then clean up everything. If you have a refrigerated room, you can leave that shit out all day. So we've established we've got these, these points, critical control points where something could go wrong. We've established these limits that says how wrong does it have to be before it's legally wrong? Fifth principle is to establish an action, uh, what they call a corrective action, that fixes the mistake. So let's use packaging. I yep. take a temperature and it is out of critical limit. Some plants will say at no point can a product exceed this temperature. I will never recommend writing something like that. No. Um for the most part, my corrective action, if I'm breaking something and not packaging it in the same day, I don't have any critical limit because it's not getting packaged. That being said, if I go outside a critical limit during the packaging process and I catch it before the bag is sealed, I would simply put it back into refrigeration, ready to get back into control, and then package it. Now, if you, if you don't have those options at all, you know, perhaps you have somebody new and they they didn't understand that the critical limit for temperature was 54 degrees um, and they missed something and you had been packaging stuff that the inspector was able to prove was above 60 the entire time. That stuff's going to get tagged. It's going to be retained by the government and then potentially discarded. Yeah, it's most likely going to get discarded. Uh, mm-hmm. You're going to have to do it in front of them so they know yeah. that it's done and you're going to have to fill out a corrective action. You're going to get an NR at that point. And if that were to happen to me, um, which something like that has never happened to me, I think I would let that person go. I think I had a couple of things retained because of a new packager. I wouldn't recommend trusting federal legal binding documents 
uh, <laughs> to to uh, untrained people. That's true, and I, I do I do kind of want to put something out there. Listen, we all know somebody like this, and if you fudge the temperatures on your CCP log for packaging. Shame on you. Don't do that. Because there's always some, I mean, people always do it, but people don't realize that it's it's perjury. And if you willingly do it and someone gets sick, you could face jail time. Yeah, I mean, a, a hefty amount, I think. It's called pencil whipping. Come on, guys. Come on. <laughs> yeah. And get your, and as inconvenient as it is, get your direct observations. We've had this this critical control point go out of limit. We have our corrective action that we need to take. How how would we how would you document a corrective action? Let's let's make an example of of something maybe that's too warm. If it's too warm and it didn't go out and mm-hmm. it was caught, uh, I would simply just write not acceptable, and then on the document, and that would be it, and then write acceptable when it went back down into the temperature. So that's a unpackaged product, not sealed, with the temperature taking before sealing. You could simply just put it back in refrigeration until it goes back under critical limits, then take it out and package it. If it um, did, if it got caught by the USDA and not me, once it was packaged, that would be an NR and I'd be responding to that report. Uh but the corrective action could just simply be on your document in, if it's internal at that point. A lot of times uh, calibrating machines on HACCP documents uh, need to be cleaned, say like available water or pH machines um, will read incorrectly and then you just do a retain cleaning of them and then retest them and then they're in calibration. I'm not going to fill out a report because I had to do a cleaning on it. I'm just going to say it failed at this time and at this time it was good. And so you're going to write those corrective actions into your plan. That's going to be part of it. You're you're going to say, if this happens at this point, here's what I will likely do uh, to fix it. And it's all about simplifying that you want your, your corrective actions in that point to be simple. Like a lot of places are going to have like a separate document for corrective actions and it's just so much extra work when you're a small per plant and you're a lot of places I've worked it, there's only one or two people and if you're spending your time filling out documentations and you're also the only one who could cut then it's fucking pointless yeah it's a lot of time yeah. a lot of time wasted because you could achieve the same standard of food safety with minimal paperwork they require the bare minimum and people who write HACCP plans genuinely don't work in the industry to the degree of people who deal with uh, HACCP plans on a daily basis. That's why the best plans are written by ex-USDA supervisors. Um, can, can you write it into a plan where everything that you do is verbal? You know, maybe just stop by the inspector's office and just tell them what the temp was of the meat and then walk back out. No, no. Just kind of put it all on him. No, that's too bad. Yeah, because everything. So, what? What's the next pillar? It's it's establish procedures for ensuring the HACCP system is working as intended. Now we're moving on to documentation. That's well. That's the last one. Okay. And then they're kind of hand in hand, though. Establish record keeping procedures. Yeah. So a lot of places you're going to keep records for two years. Uh, then Mm -hmm. you can throw them away. So if you fucked up a year and a half ago during an audit or a third-party audit or a USDA audit, you could get dinged on it if you pencil whipped. And since these are federal documents, if you make a mistake, you do a single line to cross it out and put your initial next to your mistake. Uh, I worked for a place once where um, they wrote it into their plan that uh, aging cooler monitoring had to happen every day, including on the weekends. And... Every single Saturday and Sunday, the same person would write the same numbers without variation. The thing was, is that this particular thermometer did not give a decimal point, And this person wrote decimal points, the same decimal points, week after week. Huh. 
And that was such a bummer once our uh, once our inspector kind of picked up on that. That that's called pencil whipping. He is. So yeah. so what my uh, places I've worked for do to get away with that is you have um, thermometer data loggers that mm-hmm. that's nice that yeah. will let you know if there's any uh, change in temperature and things like that. When I used to work for smaller plants, I would worry about stuff like that all the time. But now I I. I I trust in the program I have going. And that's the idea is that, you know, okay, so the a, a place where I've worked, um, they're a certified organic plant and they have ready to eat items. You know, they have a smoke program and um, every so often we have to do a listeria test. You know, it's just a, a swab sample of the food contact surfaces after packaging. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they had a couple positives for listeria. Well, everybody knows it's because there's no foot bath on the way in. There's no the, – the GMPs, uh, the good manufacturing practices and the uh, SSOP standard sanitary operating procedures aren't really adhered to. So, you know, Joe Blow, the guy that runs the saw, comes in. He went hunting that morning. His boots are covered in mud, you know, his mucks. He walks in, doesn't rinse off, and starts cutting on the saw – you know, and this guy is just splattering shit everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but nobody took that into account, and the inspector didn't really help them figure out why. So they ju- they just assumed that because they were on a farm, listeria was everywhere. So the plant manager, who had no previous experience in food production uh, whatsoever, decided that he was going to have this like almost superstitious, a superstitious ritual before they take, uh, we do hams and charcuterie. And the first thing he would do is he would go get this chemical that was an industrial degreaser mm-hmm. uh, that was beyond anything that was ever to be used in that sort of environment. And he would soak the entire cut floor in it. Gross. And then he would soak it again. And then he would soak it again. And then eventually, after it dried, he would rinse everything off, mm-hmm. and then he would bleach everything, and you know, it, it just went through this this awful procedure with all of these. And the the point is, is that if you have a HASA plan and it's been approved by the government, you should be able to trust it. You shouldn't yeah. have to go and and do all these extra steps that are kind of under the radar and make you feel better because you know you may as well just nuke the plant, you know. And and the thing about listeria is it lives. It loves living in drains and it loves living in mm-hmm. cooling uh, coils, and because it can be airborne and ride on dust particles, mm-hmm. and it also is found on forty percent of shoes in America. Think about that; it, it, it's everywhere. It's in your house. It's it, it's you know get get a few people together. It's it it's there. <laughs> um, but foot baths are you know. Get foot like you don't have to have a whole f- zep foaming system and all this shit. Just get sure. some. Uh, what is that? That TX whatever. Uh, and, I, I I like the uh, the vanquish. Yeah. Hey, hey. And just do that. Also, have your plant shoes not be your house shoes. Uh, you know, have have a changing room and encourage your employees to not wear street clothes in the processing area. Yeah. Just get some of those, you know, 1399 pair of polypropylene or PVC boots from, you know, tractor supply or whatever, and just keep them at the plant or get the $130 dumb LARPs that I use. Still not sponsored by the way. That was, that was just us. Um, so we want to establish those record keeping procedures and that's kind of outlining what it is that you're going to do throughout the week, throughout the day, throughout the hour to document the values of the critical control points to make sure that they are within the critical limits. And that kind of alerts you to know whether or not you need to take corrective actions. Say you have, you're cutting a beef and yet that beef is one lot. Uh, you're probably going to have to do a temperature monitoring per, per lot or uh, and it's usually per hour, and then uh, you're going to document that where you're going to write down the lot number of the product, what temperature it was at, 
what time it was at, that initial that it was okay, and initial if there was a corrective action, and then you're going to every once in a while have a direct observation. That's where another employee comes up, and it's like, yep, I I physically saw you do that, um, and then that is going to go and be saved because if it's not documented, then it didn't happen. And that's that's kind of goes for all the records. Um, there are records for the critical control points, as we mentioned, but there's also just regular SOPs or standard operating procedures. So it, it wasn't, we didn't necessarily think that there was going to be a hazard upon receiving uh, carcasses or boxed meat from the kill truck in the kill on the kill floor, but it was still a standard operating procedure that we had a, a, a receiving document where we, we received, you know, it was the date, the time, the lot, uh, you know, the carcass number, uh, where it came from, who did it and the temperature of the carcass. So, yeah, so that's your operating procedure, uh, your SOP. But let's say, for example, I have a pork chop and I am going to need to do, uh, for that pork chop to go into the general public and say this is, is wholesome, I'm going to have to do a record review, which is a separate document. And this record review sheet is going to say was start at the beginning. When this pig was received, was it at a temperature that met our uh, standards? Yes, it was. Was there no physical hazards? No, there wasn't. Did it come from an, an approved source? A USDA slaughterhouse? Yes, it did. Uh, was it packaged in the CCPs during packaging met? Yes, they were. If it's a smoked pork chop, was the appendix A and appendix B met, which are also CCPs during the process? Yes, it was. Was the room temperature during packaging of the smoked product kept below 70? Yes. Was it out for more than two hours? No. Was, does it have a corresponding lot number for identification and storage? Yes. And then it, you check off on all that on a separate piece of paper that all these other five pieces of paper I mentioned were also checked off on for one pork chop. Speaking of the appendixes, do you want to explain those? So appendix A is cooking lethality. Um, and it is it starts at... <clears throat> 130 and then goes up like i don't know forever but uh so if you're doing a semi-dried product 130 you're gonna want to maintain that temperature for 121 minutes to reach the lethality um then let's say you go up to 145 you're gonna want to maintain that temperature for four minutes to reach a lethality you go to 150, it's going to be two minutes. So each number in between, uh, essentially one fit, uh, I think it's like 152 is like instantaneous, I don't know. But in between 130 and 150, each degree you go up, the minutes shorten. Um, and you're going to want, in documenting that, you know, you're either going to have a spiral data logger, which I know like old smokehouses use. I know, David, you use one of those. I do. And I've never used one of those because, and they also look like a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, they are. Um, and they also look like a spirograph from when you were a kid, like the toy. And then uh, the data loggers. You know, they have digital data loggers, is what I'm used to. And you just look at a computer screen, it tells you where it is. And then if you're straying from it, you could reset your smoke program on a touch screen. Um, and then your appendix B is cooling. Um, you have to document when you put it in the cooler, usually. And you're going to have to document when uh it reaches below 130 so if it stays above 130 like in a chafing dish that's why it's safe it could stay above 130 for a week you know forever because that temperature is not going to allow stuff to grow on it but once it dips down to 129 
you have, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I think you have five hours to get it below 179. Then 10 hours to get it below 144. Now, if this is a uncured item, you're going to want to get it below 140. So that's Appendix A and Appendix B. And uh, all those points, the one, the your cooking critical limit, you're going to have to document the time and how long. And you're going to have to document at what time it reached each cooling station. Those are going to be documentation as well. Now, for those slaughter people out there that are familiar with the high prevalence season of E. coli uh, starting June 1st of every year, goes for 13 weeks. <clears throat> we swab the carcass on uh, the brisket, the flank. Yes. Yeah. And the, the rump, right? And it tests um, for generic E. coli, too. Is there anything like that with the cooked product? Is there a high prevalence, uh, kind of a random time Not of year random, when they, you know, but we do listeria do swabs. Okay. Uh, and the USDA does independent uh, listeria and plate growth modeling. You know, I think what what we ought to do on another episode soon is um, actually maybe maybe construct a little has a plan for fun. That sounds awful. Just a really basic one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we could just talk through it. We could be creative. I'm, I'm dyslexic. Um, I encourage everybody out there, you know, if you work at the type of place that would be open to this, um, go in and checking out your HACCP binder, reading your plan. I, I would say that there was a, a period of time when I was doing slaughter and I was a meat cutter that I had no understanding of HACCP. And then I went uh, to the place where we worked and was trained on HACCP. And I would say I was a completely different employee afterwards. Totally different. Night and day. Um, just the understanding that you get, it kind of helps you be uh, better at production, helps your your technique, your cleanliness, your flow, everything about your work. It, it, if you want it to, it can help you be better. It's a double-edged sword because I hate government involvement, but I also believe in food safety. The ethical libertarian. I recommend everyone read Atlas Shrug. Yeah, maybe maybe The Jungle, I guess. Why would you recommend a socialist book? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> In October, we'll talk about a plant that couldn't keep up with HACCP for a Halloween episode about the Sausage King murders. Ooh. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, stick around. We're going to have multi multiple part series with multiple guests. Uh, hopefully, Dave is going to spearhead that, not me. I'll, I'll be involved in the sense of editing and, you know, but as far as research, yeah, Musical it's just choice. more than I want to take on okay that's our HACCP episode HACCP 101 like I said we're going to be doing a more in-depth series that David is going to uh, and take on that and we'll release it over a period of time uh, about HACCP and food safety and so quick recap uh, Jack in the Box uh, had several points where they could have caught this uh, at their slaughterhouse that they punctured the gut and did a two CCPs visual and antimicrobial not saying they didn't but if they were to have that document uh in place to show that they did and then when the plant uh pre-cooked it and then when it was heated at the restaurant that there's two appendix a's that could have been met as well and because of this we adopted a plan that was already in use in canada and parts of europe and that was originated by nasa all joking aside, I do believe that food safety is important. People entrust us essentially blindly with their lives. And it's up to us to do our jobs to ensure a wholesome product for the consumer. Thank you. Sometimes I don't know if I'll make it. Sorry, gig and borrowed cigarettes. A song I wrote for the
them jokers out there talking And a cherry master choking me in old Knoxville half to death Alright, that was a long episode But HACCP is important if you're in the meat industry Especially if you're on my side of the meat industry And if you want to prolong your career And continue to be in it once Carpal Tunnel sets in And uh, things like that, then I would encourage you to get HACCP certified. Most of my job is doing paperwork and making sure things stay within critical limits and observing and not... I probably hold a knife about eight hours a week, honestly. The rest of the time I'm building sausages, running the smokehouse, and filling out awesome paperwork. It's so exciting, but very important. If you want to contact us, if you have ideas for future shows or topics or uh, questions, you can tweet us at the Meat Block Pod, email us uh, Gmail at the Meat Block Podcast, or Instagram us at the Meat Block. If you have any questions about HACCP or anything like that, feel free to uh, get a hold of David at a Farm Butcher on Instagram. We also have a Facebook group, the Meat Block. And you could find me on Instagram and Facebook at American Butcher. Even though Ryan wasn't in this episode, you can find him at Gather and Break. And he will be back with us next week. And if you're looking for ways to support the show, uh, please open up the podcast app in Apple or on your device. Uh, Type in the word meat. We are the third result. And please give us a five star review and leave a comment. It really helps us. Intro is Ring the Bell, and this is Roger Allen Wade. And until next time, keep your knife sharp and live in the margin. Mm-hmm.